Welcome and thank you for joining today's conference, Aquaculture Field Investigations, The Essentials. Before we begin, please ensure you have opened the chat panel by using the associated icon located at the bottom of your screen. Today's call will be interactive. You may select all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel to send your questions and or answers. If you require technical assistance, please send the chat to the event producer. All audio lines have been muted for the duration of the call, and as a reminder, this conference is being recorded. With that, I will turn the call over to Liz Fernandez. Please go ahead. Good morning, everyone, and I'd also like to welcome you to today's, which is our fourth webinar in a series on aquaculture. Uh, we do have five speakers on the webinar today. Dr. Tracy Dutcher is part of the Epidemiology Investigation Services, a new team within USDA Veterinary Services designed to strengthen veterinary services' ability to engage in investigation and analysis of emerging diseases and one health issues. Also with us is Dr. Julie Lennox, who is also part of the Field Epidemiology Investigation Services. Dr. Hartman, Kathleen Hartman, is the Aquaculture Program Leader for USDA APHIS Veterinary Services. She's been with USDA APHIS for over 15 years, first as an aquaculture epidemiologist, and then as the Aquaculture Coordinator in Import-Export Services. Dr. Hartman is stationed in Ruston, Florida at the University of Florida Tropical Aquaculture Laboratory. Dr. Lynn Creekmore joined USDA in October of 1999 as a staff veterinarian and wildlife disease liaison for USDA APHIS VS. In that position, she was involved in the initial development of a national chronic wasting disease program for farmed elk and deer. Dr. Creekmore joined the Western Regional Office in June of 2004 and worked on both CWD and aquaculture issues. As part of the VS reorganization, she joined the Aquatic Animal Commodity Team. She also serves as the Aquaculture Swine, Equine, and Poultry Health Center epidemiologist for non-program species when needed. And Dr. Lori Gustafson is a veterinary epidemiologist. Dr. Gustafson began her career in APHIS with the Infectious Salmon Anemia Program in Maine and has since been focused on surveillance predominantly aquaculture with the Center for Epidemiology and Analysis in Fort Collins. And with that, I'm gonna turn the webinar over to Dr. Dutcher. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. So we have really tried very hard to replicate what we would be doing if we, are in, we were in person, which is always our preference when we're talking about outbreak investigation training where we can walk through scenarios as small groups. Um, because we're virtual, we've kind of uh, bent some of those rules a little bit. So we're still trying for that in-person field. So please use the chat box as often as you can with different ideas. We're gonna be prompting you with questions throughout and would really like it to be very much of a dialogue. So we've got um, this group of speakers. Julie is going to spend most of her time looking at those chat questions, but we're all going to role play as if we were you as you put those chat questions up and communicate with us via that written communication chat function. Um, I will act kind of as your narrator <laughs> as we go through. Um, and we've got it organized in two parts, really. The first part, fairly short, is just a quick review of outbreak investigation, the essentials, and then the second part is really diving into the scenario, and that's where we're gonna spend the bulk of our time this morning. So um, let's see. First, we're gonna start with a question. So, this is to practice your chat function. How many of you have had an out aquatic animal health outbreak in your state? Or helped with an outbreak? All right. It's we working, they're voting. In the chat box. Okay. <laughs> no, they're coming, they're coming, they're coming. All right, all yeah. right. Here we go. There we go. Uh, so this is Julie, thanks Tracy. I'm getting, well, okay, they're still rolling in. Let's pause for 30 seconds. They're coming.
I've got roughly two thirds have been involved or have assisted, uh, maybe about one third have, have not had anything in their states, Tracy. Okay, very good. All right, next question. Uh, for those who did, or even if you're thinking ahead to an outbreak in the future, how many of you know already know exactly what to do? Call Kathleen, yeah. <laughs> call, call Kathleen. <laughs> yeah, you're jumping ahead to one of the punchlines. Yeah, no, so good. <laughs> well, we're looking forward to, to trying to demystify it a little bit and make you feel a little bit more confident when you first get that call. Um, one of the take home messages today though is that you can call any of us, Field Deputy Investigation Services, Kathleen, Lynn, any of us, and we will help connect the dots for you and provide some backup. So uh, with that, we're gonna get started. And I'm gonna start by handing it over to Lynn Creekmore. She's joining us just by audio. The rest of us are on video. Um, Lynn, you ready to start with why we're talking about outbreak investigations? Absolutely. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I think um, you guys all really know why, but just to um, set the stage, as you all know from your aquaculture training and in the series that you've been participating in before today, investigation and reporting is one of the, the principles of the Compre Comprehensive Aquaculture Health Program Standards. And so we're working really hard with those principles to prepare our producers and aquatic veterinarians to perform investigation and reporting when they encounter disease outbreaks on their, in their facilities. But we collectively need to be prepared as well. We need to be able to investigate and collect appropriate samples to confirm reportable diseases for aquaculture just like we do for all of our other commodities. Next slide please, Tracy. So in recent years, We've dealt with a number of disease events in aquatic animals. In fact, just this month, we have a detection of white spot syndrome virus and Ostreid herpes virus 1 that we're struggling with. So these aquaculture disease events really are keeping us all on our toes responding. Some of them are OIE listed, and of, of those, some are endemic and domestic or in wild species, and some are foreign animal diseases. Not all of these events are created equal. There are a lot of factors listed here that influence the importance of each of these events and how we end up reporting and responding. Essentially, the biopolitics. You know, are they an OIE disease? Are they endemic or, or a foreign animal disease? Um, do they affect our trade? However, even though all these events aren't biopolitically equal, um, what are your thoughts on whether or not that really fundamentally um, affects your basic disease investigation? So take a few minutes and um, list your thoughts in the chat. This is Julie, just to clarify, so Lynn's, Lynn's prompt to you is that does does the biopolitical environment or any of these other factors affect how you're going to start your basic investigation? What what are you thinking about? Very quiet. It is quiet, although I do see that some people are happy to be hearing from you and Julie on something other than rabbit hemorrhagic disease. <laughs> uh, let's see, here we go. Here come all the answers. Nice. It looks like some people are a little bit worried that how the investigation proceeds might um, might uh, be impacted by 
um, the biopolitics or that your investigation might have ramifications. But then some others are pointing out that perhaps um, investigations are sort of basically the same. Is that what you're seeing too, Julie? I am, and um, for anyone who missed it, so the, the question is, give, me, give us your thoughts on whether any of these complicating events, whether there's biopolitical pressures or it's an OIE event or other, you know, other kind of statuses, does that change your basic investigation protocol and, and kind of what you're going to get started with? Um, yes, so the, the answers are, are um, lots of good thoughts here. So um, somebody's talking about transparency, your stakeholders that are involved, um, impact to the industry, uh, the um, international incident, whether that's going to create any, any different um, type of scrutiny or, or eyes on it. Um, somebody answers differently that the investigation will be the same, um, but the rules can change. Uh, how do we move from quarantine? How can animals be processed? Um, basically processing the same way, you're doing your tracing, your epi interview, your site visits. Keeping consideration that stakeholders might change, but the basic steps will be the same. Asking if it's an OIE reportable disease, interagency coordination. Yeah, so, so both sides of the fence. One, half the group is saying it shouldn't really change the basic um, steps, but others are taking into consideration um, that, uh, you know, other factors and especially as stakeholders and pressures may be a little bit different. Okay, and just the kind of logistics, um, some of the attendees are writing they can only see their own comments. They can't see what others are saying. Are, is that, was that how we intended it? Or well, I can see all of yours. So, so as long as you're writing in, I can, I can see everything that's coming through. So I, if I think they send a chat to the panelists, only the panelists can see it, and therefore the participants cannot view their own chats amongst themselves. If you would like, okay. I can open up communications so that they can. Well, then are you going to copy everybody else's answers? <laughs> Just, I think it's fine if they can see. I, in my, I mean, team, are you guys okay if everyone can see what everyone else is writing? I think that's great. Yeah. Sure. It makes it a little yeah, more okay. interactive. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So Jayla I have is, oh, thank you. I yeah, have I opened that. the attendee communications lines. From now on, please address your comments to all participants instead of all panelists. All right. Thank you, Jayla. We Fantastic. appreciate your help. Of course. Yeah. So, so yeah. So, Lynn, um, most folks say that they're still going to go through the same basic steps, but they're keeping in mind um, pressures, different scrutiny, trade, um, quarantines, processing, and um, any other, you know, kind of big pressure political issues. You're good. So super input. I think, you know, um, as you guys are pointing out, um, some of these elements might impact your um, investigation, but in most instances, um, the way you are going to de uh, carry out your FE investigation is really uh, fundamentally the same, whether we're talking about a cow, a chicken, a pig, an oyster, a shrimp, or a fish. And I'm going to turn it over to Tracy to help um, convince you even further that um, <laughs> that the basic fundamental bones of an investigation are pretty much the same. That's, thanks, Lynn. And that's exactly what the first part of this conversation is really designed to do. So um, as a quick reminder, we did, Liz, on behalf of our team, sent out an email this morning with some handouts. The next few slides are included in that outbreak investigation quick reference guide that was attached to that email this morning. We're just going to walk through those and we're going to identify a couple of places where sometimes things might differ a little bit depending on some of those factors that we were highlighting earlier. But as Lynn said, you know, at the end of the day, the bones of the investigation are the same, the steps are more or less the same. So we're going to start by looking at the first three steps. Um, and we've got it sort of chunked in groups just by, for convenience, but one of the really important components, as I'm sure you all know, is that these are not linear steps. They're not, you do this one, then you do this one, then you, 
So they're not independent. A lot of times they're happening almost at the same time, and you're just sort of juggling and getting everything organized as you go. So, but the first three are really getting a, an understanding after you get that phone call or after you get that notification, do we really have an outbreak? Are the cases that are being reported accurate? Do we have a lot of confidence in that? Or is this increase in cases or is this finding some sort of artifact or other curiosity? You know, it, could it be a change in processes, a change in laboratory tests, a change in personnel, um, a change in expectations or, or someone, you know, um, mistakenly interpreting a test? You know, so there are a lot of things that can go into this question of, do we actually have an outbreak? And then you start trying to understand who, who needs to know and what kind of information do we already have. And in this phase, having a joint call is really valuable, getting all the different players on the phone, especially the local, state, and federal animal health officials who have the most current information who know what's going on on the ground, potentially connecting them with people like ourselves, field epi investigation services, commodity health team, SIA, just really being able to exchange information and, and figure out a potential path forward. And one of those pieces, you know, if it's a zoonotic disease, the next step might be to engage in a, a large conversation with our One Health partners, public health, state and federal, other players, industry at times, you know, just getting all of those voices on the phone together can be really valuable in exchanging information. If you don't know who to call, uh, the reason I put the Field Deputy Investigation Services contact information here, this is our email address that goes to all four of us on the team. You can always email us. We're a bridge or a conduit between field and staff or the other parts of veterinary services, and we're here to help connect all of those dots, among other things. So um, as we're trying to really nail that, that step of confirming the diagnosis, are we really sure about the lab results? Um, that's possibly where one of the places we might run into some trouble can crop up. What, um, now we're gonna go back to you guys. Chat, where are some of the other things? What are some of the things that you can think of in this first group of three steps where things might get um, complicated or, or be different for an aquatic animal health event. So again, this is Julie looking um, into the chat box. You do want to put it to all attendees and then everyone will be able to see each other's answers. I can see everyone's. And the question is, looking at these first three steps, what, what are your thoughts? What are other things that you're considering? Um, what are your answers? Who else might need to know? Who are you going to reach out to? What do you do if you need help? And do you have any other just, just um, kind of gut check, uh, boots on the ground? What are you thinking about for these first three steps for the aquaculture investigation? We'll give you a minute to chime in. All right, so I think that a couple of people, and I did sort of give away one of the answers, you know, laboratory or diagnostic issues can be one. Um, I also see in the chat determining who needs to know varies by state and by species, and for sure that is also um, a component, as well as, you know, figuring out how you're going to collect that more information about what's happening on the premise. Um, with that in mind, too, let's talk a little bit more about that laboratory issue. Um, oh, there was my question. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. Um, 
uh, Kathleen, do you have, you want to chime in for a minute about some of the issues that you run into in that first, those first three steps, particularly around labs? Sure, of course. Thanks, Tracy. You guys are doing a great job here today. Um, so a couple of testing issues might come up right off the bat. And one is, do is it acceptable to um, have the detecting laboratory submit their already handled process materials for confirmation to the lab, or do additional samples need to be collected from the site uh, directly? Um, and that's a question that can go a couple of different ways and is going to obviously vary depending upon the situation and the availability of material. Uh, in some cases, it is preferential to have new samples collected and sent directly to NVSL. Clearly, it removes any question regarding was there laboratory contamination? Did something happen um, as they were processing the samples there? However, we also want to help our laboratory partners make sure that the work that they're doing um, is 100% accurate and valid. Also, in certain cases, um, particularly with emerging diseases, the concern about the availability of uh, positive control material and also what assay is the best assay um, available. Uh, in an example that we're going to use later, fortunately, um, we had been working with international partners and were able to secure through one of our domestic laboratories uh, positive control material from another country. Uh, and we had um, researchers in this country already looking and trying to validate a diagnostic procedure. So all of those questions, I think, should come up, again, regarding what sample is appropriate and what sample do we need to be able to confirm the detection? Do we have appropriate positive control material? And do we have an assay that we feel confident in the results? Thanks, you guys. Happy to take any questions on that component. Perfect, Kathleen. If you have any questions, you can start putting them into the chat. We'll keep going into the next few steps, and we'll circle back for questions. So the next three steps really are around trying to understand what are we defining as a case, and how are we going to find those cases of disease? Which ones are we counting? What if this is a brand new disease? Do we have an existing case definition? What information do I need to know or do I need to be collecting with my questionnaire? Is there a specific questionnaire? Um, and really, these steps are all about trying to gather the information you need to start formulating some initial hypotheses. You're going to, um, as I mentioned, you're gonna use a questionnaire. We uh, the aquaculture team has developed some standardized questionnaires. Those continue to be refined, but we have some for finfish. We have some for shellfish. And it's really about structuring the data consistently so that you can begin to describe and orient that data in space and time by animal, by farm. That's that performing a descriptive analysis function. And you're really trying to understand what's the population at risk? How are the animals grouped? Are they sharing any common pathways? Um, am I seeing distinctions in, you know, certain lots, you know, or certain tanks, certain raceways, certain age groups, certain species on the farm? All of those questions are coming in. Now that can be overwhelming, especially as you start to think about putting all your data into an Excel spreadsheet and starting to think about this, uh, how you're going to analyze it. But it's not intended to be overwhelming because one thing to really, we're going to continue to emphasize throughout this presentation is that epidemiology is really a team sport and that you have a lot of resources at your disposal. And so I'm going to uh, open it up for Lori Gustafson from Center for Animal Epidemiology and Animal Health, SIA, to talk a little bit about what resources are available when we need them. Lori? Yeah, hey, hi everybody. Um, <clears throat> so I work at SIA and I'm with the surveillance group. But um, 
We have in SIA a whole bunch of folks that are really interested in aquaculture. Um, and the way SIA works is um, we're really here to support the field. We're here to support the commodity groups. Um, and we think of ourselves kind of as decision support folks. So if you guys have um, questions that need um, literature, you know, to back them up or that need calculations or quick analyses or um, briefings, we, those are the kinds of things that we, we love to do. So um, you can reach out to us at any point um, and talk with us directly. If it's a project, if it starts to look bigger and have sort of decision points along the way, then um, we never really do that without without joining up with our team here. So the, the field group and the aquaculture commodity group are always at the table for those kinds of bigger tasks. But um, some of the support that we've provided in the past are things like um, um, emerging disease uh, risk notices, um, uh, sampling plans, um, analytics, and maps. Um, we help with case definitions. We help with OIE reporting. Um, and yeah, we just love to be involved. We've got a little bit of, I guess, field envy. You know, we're kind of, we, we don't get to go out as often as the rest of you, so we, we crave these conversations, so yeah. Perfect. Thanks, Lori. And as we move into the exercise portion, you will get to see up close where and how we relied on SIA to help with this particular investigation. Julie, I'm going to check in with you. Anything coming across in the chat before we move on to the final steps here? No, we're good right now, Tracy. Thanks. Sure. Okay. So, Seven, eight, nine, ten. those are, you know, the steps one through ten, just very quickly. Basically, when you move into this sort of final phase of activity, you're really um, looking at your data, developing and evaluating your ideas about what's going on, um, where the disease got introduced, how it got introduced, how it's being spread, where it might have spread to. Um, Really thinking, looking at trends over time, you might be building epi curves to continue to track different events. You keep asking these questions as you're coming up with the ideas for prevention and control measures. You're beginning to implement those and then sort of evaluating some those efforts to see has it stopped disease spread? Are those efforts fully effective? And if not, you can continue to refine. So this is a little bit of an iterative process in this ending part. And then last but not least, and those who attended our field epi training course in November remember this message loud and clear. You really need to focus on communicating your findings, whether that's um, ongoing situation reports throughout the event to update people, decision makers, others about what's happening, what actions were taken, and what the results were of those actions. But really at the end, just to tie up the loose ends to help people understand what you did. And then people don't have to make it up the next time. They can go back and refer to that and start building the knowledge base around some of these activities. Uh, I will open it up to the team of speakers. Any any points you guys want to emphasize about the steps of outbreak investigation that I skipped over? Hey, Tracy, this is Kathleen, and I would just encourage everybody, um, since a lot of us do have field envy, the number, there is never too many pictures. Um, and then being able to share those pictures with us. Mm -hmm. um, with a narrative is really helpful, particularly if um, when in aquaculture we're talking about systems and water source and separation between systems, those types of things. Um, being able to share that information not only on paper but in pictures uh, is really helpful. And oftentimes um, we can get a lot from those uh, pictures. So again, you know, Hopefully, the farm is cooperative uh, with allowing pictures to be taken. But again, you know, just being able to share those. And if you have a lot, we have SharePoint sites or different kinds of drives that we can direct you to to dump those. 
um, so that we can help work through, you know, what's actually going on there on the farm. I think that's a good, really good point. And Google Earth uh, can also help a lot with those satellite images of various aspects of the farm and how it's laid out and really better understanding those um, breaks between the populations, which is pretty important as you'll hear pretty soon. And uh, th this is Lynn, just to back up to the team. And I think everyone sort of is, is really dialed into this because they've got Kathleen on speed dial. But just want to <laughs> remind everyone to to remember the commodity team also as part of your your team, right. and that we can work with FEIS to really serve as that nexus to be the conduit to bring together all the resources that you need to um, to investigate and respond, and also to make sure all these other groups that need to know what's happening um, also are, in, are informed like import-export and our OIE reporting team. Right. Thanks, Lynn. Yep. Uh, you've heard it once, twice, maybe three times already, and you're going to hear it multiple times throughout this morning. So basically, it doesn't matter who you call, you know, we're here to help and we will help you connect the dots. So. Uh, that's what we have in terms of the overview and just the quick reminder refresher for many um, reference. You have the quick reference guide in your hands from or in your email from this morning. We're going to open it up for questions now before we move into the rest of the scenario. And this is just a quick recap, you know. Um, Looking at those first three steps were really about getting your arms around what's happening, understanding it, making sure what you're really dealing with, and then coming up with a way to gather some data, find cases, summarize and describe them, develop some hypotheses around what's going on, use your data and continual analysis to continue to refine your hypotheses, implement the prevention and control measures, and then communicate those findings out. Any questions on what we've covered so far before we dive in to the next part of the presentation? So this is Julie. We've got five or 10 minutes right now just to go over any, any wrap up. Um, and one thing I will say, um, Tracy, can you, can you go back to those 10 steps, please? Um, I'm going to put a plug in here because this is where I get burned from time to time on who to notify the AVICs. Um, I hear that more than anything else that our AVICs say they are the last person to know that there's an investigation going on in their state. Um, and, and I know that has proven true and, and I've had communication with some state animal health officials and then it gets back to the AVIC and they're like, hey, Julie, when you're talking to my Saho, can you please see, see me so I know what's going on? Um, so just a plug there because because they get left out of the loop somehow, um, and that's just our communication chain. So just keep that in mind. So you want to keep on the good side of those folks. Um, but but really this this first part was intended just to be a wrap up and make sure everybody has their feet under them. We've had three great sessions already to learn about you know the aquaculture basics. Uh, who our resources are, both in the commodity health staff, in SIA, in our program staff. Um, obviously, we're all on the phone right now, so, so you know who the resources are. And, and if you can't find anyone or you can't remember anyone's name, call FEIS and we'll get you connected to them and make sure that you've got the resources that you need, um, whether that's Office of Interagency Coordination, Trade Staff, One Health, um, any of those folks. But um, let's pause for a minute here and see if there's anything that we need to clarify or any basics that, that you want to discuss. Um, we've got, again, we've got about five minutes or so, so we'll wait for a couple questions to come in. And then um, we're gonna take the this foundational work that we have and move into a specific. So now is a good time to, to ask your questions before we take a little break. Hey, uh, Tracy and Julie, it's Kathleen. Well, folks are typing in their questions. I just want to empower all of you that really the only thing different about aquaculture is the media that the animals live in. 
Um, and don't let that intimidate you because um, hopefully the farm knows um, that this event has somehow exceeded an acceptable threshold that it's not um, water quality related or anything else um, that uh, and, you know, again, you have a team of folks behind you that can help work through some of those issues. Also, if the water is going to be a factor in how we handle um, the farm. Uh, so, again, don't let that um, confound any issues because it's going to be okay. Phys animal physiology works pretty much the same, at least uh, for finfish. When we start talking about shrimp, and mollusks, um, it gets a little crazy there. Um, but also, a question came up in the chat or a comment came up in the chat that um, knowing who to notify, I think, as Julie pointed out, it's easy on our side that the AVIC is our point of contact for notification there. In many states, the Authority for Aquatic Animal Health um, might be in the Department of Ag. It also might be in the Department of Natural Resources. And in some states, nobody has authority for aquaculture. So you're not going to have a SAHO um, that is a willing participant necessarily in these types of outbreaks. And of course, where that leaves us is in this vacuum of who is going to implement a farm level quarantine if we need one, or who is going to do a hold order, and who is going to help us um, as the boots on the ground. So if you find yourself in one of those situations where the state level authority is ambiguous, vague, unknown, um, let us know uh, between the team of folks here, we know um, just about everybody across the country. Uh, an important distinction too is that the Department of Natural Resources, for most of our states, that's where aquatic animal health or aquaculture help fall under. That entity within the state does not have that kind of authority that the state veterinarian does. Uh, we are working with our partners um, at the state level and through AFWA to develop memorandums of agreement like um, exist for uh, CWD where they have that agreement in, in wartime or disease outbreak time that those agreements where we can have a transfer of authority temporarily so that we're able to um, address those needs appropriately. Really good point. All yeah. good points, Kathleen. Go yeah, ahead, Kathleen, Julie. is that something that they can they can figure out ahead of time? I mean, is there a way? I mean, most of the folks in this class are in a geographic area, so is there a way that they can determine who their point of contact is or who has regulatory authority, if any, in their particular state? Yes, and I would say that a couple of years ago, we had a list of points of contact. Um, it hasn't been kept up to date because it changes so often. My best recommendation, and typically what I do is um, Google. Yesterday, I got a question about Idaho, and I, you know, who, where does aquaculture health or aquatic animal health um, in Idaho? And again, it can be confusing because some of the lingo fisheries or recreational fisheries is very different than aquaculture and fishing licenses um, are a different thing. Um, so if you can't find it through an internet search, I'm always happy to help, but also just calling your state veterinarian or one of those agencies that do the fishing regulations, uh, they should be able to help and direct you to the right entity. Great. Thank you. And I do have another question that came in, um, go, going back to those 10 steps, Tracy, in, this, in context, this says, in the case finding steps, how far back and how far away geographically do you go? That's a really good question. Thanks, Michelle, for asking that. We, um, we will... If you don't mind, let's hold that question. We're going to illustrate that a little bit in this scenario, and then we can come back 
during the Q&A session after the exercise to give you a little bit more detail, okay? So okay. first we have to test you, then you get the answer. <laughs> so, all right, okay. in the interest of time, because we wanna to go to the fun stuff, wait, I hear Lynn, wait. are you saying? I hear Lynn. Yeah, well, and just really quickly, um, and I think we are getting ready to break and getting toward that time. But just in case, those of you that have responded to a, an aquaculture disease event in your state, sort of flipping the question on its head a little bit that we asked earlier, but just to ask you guys, is there anything else you can think of that um, you think would be a good point or a relevant piece of information to include before we move on from your experience? something that's a little bit different from aquacul in the aquaculture investigations that you've encountered, perhaps. So just to repeat the question, Lynn, it's um, did we miss anything that's a unique aspect of aquatic animal health investigations that people who've done them have run into? Yeah, much much better said, in fact. Thanks, Drake. <laughs> Just rephrasing. Nope, it's all good. All right, you can be putting your answers in. We are at sort of our, our quick coffee break component. Um, so we're Josh, this is super fast, you guys. Um, we're gonna start back at 10 till. So you have five minutes. This five minutes is to, um, Get more coffee if you want more coffee, get a snack, take a quick break, um, pull up your email and click on the links that we sent you because you will want those resources here in just a couple minutes. So again, do not disconnect. Julie, help me emphasize all the key points we needed. Yeah, no, We're I was just saying that. Don't, don't, don't hang up, don't, don't turn off your WebEx, just um, mute your line if you're gonna walk away or take a, take a bathroom break or grab some coffee. Uh, set your clock for five minutes if you plan to bounce over to your email because everybody can get sucked into that vortex. Um, just, yes, just don't even open the email. Turn it off for just a second. <laughs> certainly, if you feel like um, typing, you know, if a thought comes to you, type it in and we'll catch up on chat right before we get started. But five minute break and we'll, we'll all be right back.
Okay, everyone. I've got 10 till. This is Tracy again. We'll start to bring together our presenters, our speakers as well. In the meantime, for those who are back with me on chat, that email that you received this morning has the, a, an example of the EPI questionnaire that we've used for some of these investigations. We do have one for fish. We, as I mentioned, there's one for shellfish. You can see how it's structured to start collecting information about the population, the morbidity, the mortality, clinical symptoms, and some key dates, like when were the first samples collected, when were the first clinical signs noted, what were the first clinical signs, what did they do with all the affected fish, and those sorts of questions. Okay, hopefully we have everyone back. And now we're gonna jump in to the, what I think is the most fun part of today's presentation. All right, so we already mentioned you not hanging up. Um, as we mentioned at the very beginning, we designed this for as much interaction as possible and that we, really thought through, you know, what we would be doing with you if you were in table groups and working through some of these questions. So again, we are um, relying on Julie in large part to shout out your questions and uh, sort of be the voice for each of the table groups. And Julie, Tracy, go ahead. A, yeah, can I just get a second with everyone? Can everyone just give me a response that you're back? We just wanna know everybody's back online and hopefully Give me a thumbs up or a yes or a hello. Hello, hello, good. I know that there's at least 20 people here, so. Yeah, <laughs> and we just, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, here we go. Yeah, so everyone, we appreciate this. I know it's a little bit of an odd format because you can't talk, but uh, but I will try to speak for you. Um, and we do want this as interactive as possible. So the more chiming in and quick answers and, and sort of, um, you know, be ready to put your thoughts in a, a, as we go along. So so this is a this is a role play. So you're, you're active in the second half of it to so make <laughs> sure that um, you've got your chat box open. We appreciate it. And as a reminder, I will, for the most part, be your friendly narrator and be introducing various um, roles, people uh, throughout the, the scenario. So if you can sort of envision in your head one of those documentaries where the narrator is sort of telling you things that are unfolding and then we break and do an up-close interview with people who are involved, um, that's kind of the vibe we were going for. And by all means, at the end of this, um, we'd love your feedback because we're new at this whole virtual delivery. So, you know, and anything that you can tell us in terms of how to make this more, uh, more effective, more valuable for you, we'd really appreciate. Okay. And so it begins. And Let's uh, Tracy, just jump a, in. Just Julie? A, I, yeah. Oh, hey, Tracy, it's Liz. I just want to give a shout out, a reminder to everyone that they also received an evaluation on their email last week and their email today. And we really would appreciate everyone um, filling out that evaluation because that only helps us to develop ourselves in this new virtual reality. So that's just exactly. my shout out. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. Good, appreciate it. Okay, and so it begins. So it's uh, four o'clock on a Friday afternoon. You're sitting at your desk. That's pretty much how all outbreaks start, right? four o'clock, you're about ready to head out for the weekend, and here comes the call. Um, so Kathleen, do you wanna set the stage for us? What happened? Of course, thanks Tracy. So yes, inevitably it's always gonna hit the fan on a Friday, and in this particular case, 
Um, it was at the start of an aquaculture conference, um, and so all of us were a little bit out of pocket um, that way. What happened in this scenario was that one of our private laboratories here in the United States had a client that was importing um, multiple strains of uh, tilapia into the United States. Uh, we had already sent out an alert about tilapia lake virus and the risk of that coming in. Um, the laboratory, the sorry, the producer submitted animals because something just wasn't right. There was increased um, mortality that exceeded the normal post-shipping um, scenario that we typically may see um, following that. They initially did cell culture got a positive CPE on that. Uh, because of the species and the source country where the animals came from, uh, that, was, that um, was sent off to another uh, institutional laboratory here in the United States, and they had um, presumptively diagnosed um, TILV. At that point, then, the farmer, of course, was informed that uh, of that diagnosis. Now, the tricky part with this one became that TILV is not an OIE-listed uh, pathogen, um, and so we did spend some time trying to figure out what to do um, about that case. Um, we did decide then... Oh. Go ahead. Are you jumping ahead? You giving them the Nope, answer? I'm trying not to. Nope. So <laughs> okay. uh, then how do we uh, – also, this laboratory did have um, positive control virus that we were able to securely help them acquire in the year previous to this detection. So we – the laboratory was pretty confident that this was um, uh, TILV in this case. Um, we then requested that they send those samples to NVSL along with uh, the positive control material that they had received, which they were more than happy to do. Uh, and then NVSL did uh, confirm that finding of tilapia lake virus. Now, I only bring this up um, as a learning tool particularly in these ones that are emerging, uh, whether it's OIE listed or not, um, there was an issue of that because it wasn't necessarily reportable either at the federal level or at the state level, did the farm have to reveal to APHIS uh, where the farm was. And so we spent a great deal of time, which unfortunately delayed a lot of our ability to respond in a timely fashion. Uh, and we spent about seven to ten, I would say about maybe, gosh, if I recall correctly, it was between four and five weeks um, settling a subpoena issue between the um, laboratory that diagnosed uh, the detection and then being able to tell us where the farm was. Um, and fortunately, that got resolved. It was very costly um, for the laboratory to do that, to respond to a federal subpoena in that way. The animals did, as I mentioned, come from a country that was known to have tilapia lake virus. Um, and so, again, that heightened all of our suspicion about what was going on here. Perfect. All right. So, you got the phone call. You're fairly confident in the laboratory findings that this is tilapia lake virus. Struggling to get some information. All right, so our question to the participants, how serious is this? What are you going to do? It's not on the OIE list. What other sources of information might you have to help guide some of your choices here? Hint, we did send out an email with a couple of them. 
we'll give everyone a couple minutes. Um, I'll wait until we've got some, some chat answers in. So, uh, yeah, Tracy's question is, how serious is this? What are, what are you going to do next? Where are you finding your information? Thanks. Yeah, and this is Kathleen. I might help you guys or lead you all to an answer is that maybe one question might be, what was the business model of this farm? Um, was there was this a farm that was going to be shipping animals around the United States or back out to other foreign uh, trading partners? In this particular case, um, this farm had was a uh, tilapia in this country and a lot. Sorry, it's that second cup of coffee. My brain doesn't keep up with my tongue or vice versa. So the business model of the infected premise was he shipped live tilapia to uh, multiple states for human consumption. All right, to our participants, right. I'm going to set a timer for maybe two minutes, give everybody time to think for a minute, and just put your um, thoughts in the chat box. Okay, so we're getting some answers here, Julie. Indeed, okay. So, oh, they're kind of scrolling because there's more popping up. Uh, okay, so a couple of thoughts. You know, to answer what do you do and where are you looking for more information, um, there's answers to say, you know, looking in textbooks, had a group of veterinarians who are SMEs that they might go to, including aquatics that they would call, uh, keeping up on continuing ed, things like this. You know, get your build, build your list of your of your people to go to, build your toolbox. Um, someone else wanted to pretty quickly notify their state animal health official, their AVIC, AVIC is a thank you, and their um, their DNR colleagues um, who regulate. Um, the tilapia in that state, so that person is aware of who um, has regulatory authority. Uh, another participant um, is kind of chiming in on the how serious is this. It's not known to pose a human risk, but it is an emerging disease, so keeping that in mind. Again, sort of the notification part, SAHOs, NVSL, good to get your lab, lab team geared up pretty quickly. Um, the commodity health staff, FDA, question mark, food. Uh, and then talking about getting samples to the appropriate lab, building from there, and then you can make your decision tree to um, determine what your next steps are gonna be. Um, Natalie wants to talk more to the producer, get background on the situation, just sort of get boots on the ground and, and figure out kind of what we're actually dealing with. And then um, a medical, oh, oh, medium risk. Sorry, medium risk. Likely, uh, likelihood of further spread is low due to retail distribution. However, a positive detection could have negative impacts on the tilapia industry at large. 
you're thinking more a little bit more about the economic effects, possibly trade, possibly sales. So um, lo lots of good thoughts coming in. Um, I, I guess maybe quickly, can we answer um, about notifying um, FDA and NBSL? Does anyone want to chime in on, on those two? Those are um, both unique thoughts, I think. For sure. So um, NBSL, absolutely, because I think hidden in Kathleen's sum up of the situation were, you know, multiple calls to NBSL to coordinate between the laboratory, you know, the private lab and our confirmatory lab. Um, FDA, uh, Richard, I'm curious why notification of FDA. I'm assuming you because of the retail fishery component or inspection of retail fish. Yeah, food fish. Okay. Um, so, Tracy, I can uh, address that if you like. Please do. Awesome. So, FDA uh, does have regulatory oversight of imported seafood. <laughs> Um, and it's really up to the state departments of health beyond that. So uh, the state departments of health would be the ones that would intervene if a food item was considered contaminated or had a zoonotic risk um, of those types of things. It would not necessarily be to FDA. Um, certainly they could, and they should, obviously, be looped in if we are making a notification um, to the State Department of Health to pull in our fish team from the FDA side. Never a bad idea. Um, but ultimately, they don't have any authority over um, aquatic animals being moved interstate uh, in terms of wholesomeness, that kind of thing. That does come down to the State Department of Health. Exactly. Thanks, Kathleen. So, um, you guys really did a good job hey, Trace, collecting all of that information. Yes, Lynn. Before you go on, would you um, elaborate a little bit on the hints that you felt that you pro we provided? What was in, what was sent to the participants that might have been helpful? Yeah, absolutely. You read my mind. Um, so, what we were, so, you heard this in Kathleen's setup, too, and so we were giving you lots of hints around um, what was going on. So in terms of how serious is this, this was a first detection in the United States. It was um, recognized as a globally emerging pathogen. We now have a national list of reportable animal diseases and system standards for those that clearly define what an emerging disease is. This fell into that emerging disease category. And I think most of you were recognizing that we really needed to get a little bit more information. As Kathleen pointed out, even though we had a high level of confidence in the private lab, we wanted to confirm that test within NVSL because of our role as the Animal Health Authority. And then um, that potential for spread. We were talking a little bit about what we knew at the time about this person's business model and their production model. So we heard that they've been importing from this uh, country that has known tilapia lake virus as an endemic problem. We didn't really know what safeguards they had in place. We didn't we think we know what his production model is, but we may or may not know. So we have some questions about not only how was it introduced, but when was it introduced and where it might have gone. And were there any points in time where there were variations from that production model? Um, if he's shipping fish to the markets, retail markets, is there a risk associated with the water in the tanks that those fish are being transported in? You know, you're thinking through this whole production system and all of the potential routes of introduction, spread on the farm, spread to other farms, as well as spread um, just by virtue of the production model. Team, anything that I missed in terms of that recap? No? All right. So like Natalie said, we really think that maybe 
getting some more information might be wise here. So as you start thinking about going out into the field, um, what do you need to consider? How do you start preparing for that field work? How do you start preparing to confirm that diagnosis and construct a work, working case definition? So again, um, pop quiz, who are you going to call? We've been dropping hints all morning, right? What help it's do you not, think you can find? It's not Ghostbusters, right? <laughs> it's not Ghostbusters, no, not Ghostbusters. You can enter your answers in the chat. All right. We're starting to roll in, Tracy. Give everybody just a minute. So fast in. <laughs> Richard Aston is hearing <laughs> loud and clear. The ABIC is. <laughs> and just for the record, I'm not an ABIC. I just hear the feedback <laughs> pretty frequently. So. <laughs> Right, you can certainly call, for sure, the ABIC, and the ABIC can decide whether they have the local resources to respond or not. You can call Field Epi Investigation Services team, me, Julie, Jason, you know, drop us an email. Lynn and Kathleen are standing by to take your calls as well, any day, anytime. <laughs> really, what we want to start doing is um, thinking about all of those pieces. What kind of data might I need to collect on the farm? Does somebody have a questionnaire that I can use? You know, is there an updated version of this questionnaire? Because at the end of the day, one of the really valuable components of these EPI investigations is to start to develop a baseline of information about what we know, which really helps inform the industry and us about risk factors, prevention, biosecurity, things of that sort of thing. We want to make sure that we're looping in the labs. We want to make sure we're looping in SIA, especially if we anticipate any questions heading their way. So we're going to be doing all of those things in this step. Contacting aquaculture staff, contacting state regulatory authority. And this goes back to Kathleen's comment about um, understanding who has authority, because as you're going to see, we are um, going to test that in a couple instances in this outbreak. What's their stance on response and who can place a quarantine or stop movement order? All right, next question, preparing for the site visit. So we've decided that we're going out to get some more information. And, um, and in this case, we absolutely did. We were forming a field team and getting ready to go out to visit the farm. And uh, Lynn, do you want to start describing some of the things that you and Kathleen were discussing as we got ready to go out? Sure. And just to point out that at that point, we were really discussing it with our local field responders as well. And so some of the basics are, you know, what and we've been talking about this over the past couple of slides, actually, but starting with that EPI questionnaire, um, what, is, what information do we already have from the discussions that have already gone on and what do we need to focus on when we do get some boots on the ground out at the farm? Um, working with the laboratories, contacting them and finding out, hey, what kind of samples do we need to collect for um, tilapia lake virus? Um, testing and how do we need to preserve those and get them to you? Um, are we gonna? Are the samples that we're gonna collect? Are they the kind of samples that are um, that we can collect from a live animal? Or are we gonna have to euthanize animals in order to collect our samples? And if we're gonna have to euthanize animals, how's that gonna happen? Where do we find the best information on how to deal with the, the species involved? Um, and then, really importantly, once we get um, this idea of all the things we need for information gathering, sampling, 
um, and that potential euthanasia, um, working with our field folks to, to really um, understand how they feel about that locally in terms of getting that done. And for some of the things that we deal with in aquaculture, like this um, example, it's absolutely new for all of us. And so in, in the case of, of this um, outbreak, the answer from our local field folks were, yes, we definitely want help. So at that point, um, we, um, at the staff level and with FEIS and with SIA, we're thinking about how we can mobilize the help that was needed to travel out to the districts to provide that help. Um, so then once we get there, um, how, do we, how do we have the, the um, materials and equipment that we need to get the job done? Again, as Kathleen pointed out, a lot of what we're doing in aquaculture, it's, it's really not that foreign. So a lot of what is needed for a field investigation and for sampling is available at the local district offices, so like um, dissecting tools, necropsy instrument, whirl pack, shipping containers for getting uh, materials to the laboratory. But also important to know that um, you know a lot of the things that we need for uh, dealing with fish are things that are available locally um, at your friendly Walmart. So then when we, we got out there, to get those materials, we just um, created a shopping list and hit the Walmart. So um, again, not something to be really um, intimidated by. And just to put in a plug here, we are working in our aquaculture group to come up with an aquaculture investigation sampling and response kit that um, will include um, just the basics that you need to do um, aquatic animal necropsies and sampling. And once we get that, those, those packs up and available, we'll have those ready to send out to you guys for investigations. Any other Perfect. things to build on there, Kathleen or um, Julie and Tracy, that I missed? Nope, that sounds about right. I think. Uh, the hardest question to answer there is, you know, if the animals have to be euthanized, how are we going to do that? Um, Great. And we have solutions for that or um, options for that. And Kathleen and Lynn can guide you through that when the time comes. Okay. So we did gear up. And along with the state veterinarian and the um, VS epidemiologist, we went out to this farm in Idaho. <clears throat> um, we arrived on premise, and what our goals were in this field visit were really to identify the potential pathways of, and sources of introduction of tilapia lake virus to the facility. We wanted to understand the disease and potential exposure status of the fish that were remaining on the property and really begin to understand the potential animal movements and potential exposure to other facilities. So basically the trace in, trace out kind of component of this to see, you know, was this an isolated incident or had we potentially seeded uh, tilapia lake virus in multiple other facilities in the country. So um, at the time of our visit, you know, I started, uh, I was one of the folks that arrived on site. I started working with the owner to ask some of the questions. Um, we had a total population of around 104,000 tilapia on site. Um, they were grouped in different age classes. Uh, the owner did tell us that the farm regularly imported tilapia from a, a tilapia Lake virus positive country and had been doing so since 2006. He described all of the safeguards that country had in place or that the farm that he was working with had in place. But then also described onset of clinical signs in the fry uh, and a morbidity or mortality of, 
rate above what he expected. Getting the dates nailed down um, was one of the, the challenges that we ran into um, in terms of what date did those shipments arrive and what date did some other shipments go out. So we were spending some time on that. But in order to really understand the disease and exposure status of the fish remaining on property, we wanted to collect some samples. So um, the question really was, how many samples? And from which tanks? We had multiple tanks. We had a building. You can see in that middle photo, that white building had um, the nursery and hatchery tanks in it. We had these raceways um, in the middle picture and the picture to the right. We had these raceways uh, with multiple age groups of fish in them, um, each sort of cement tank here had a specific age class of fish, but there was, um, you know, there were multiple of those. There were a set of three on this upper, in the middle picture here that's on the upper part of the property, and then down below by those white buildings, there are another set of three tanks. And then there, in one of those white buildings adjacent to the nursery, we have this tank on the left, in the leftmost photo with a different age group of fish. So as a team, we decided we needed to phone a friend. And um, we're gonna call Thea, we're gonna call Lori for some help. She'd given us some initial guidance on sampling, but now that we have eyes on the tanks and eyes on the fish, we're gonna call and check back in with her. What are some questions you guys think that we should be asking her as we make this phone call? Let's get our get ourselves organized. Okay, so to the attendees, you are now getting ready to phone your friends because you're getting ready to go out there. So uh, I'll channel I'll channel for you. So what are the questions you're preparing? You're jotting down in your little notebook for when you get a hold of your aquatic SME. We'll give you two or three minutes to write down your thoughts. Thanks. Hey, Tracy, can you go back to the picture slide? Sure can. Just so everybody's got that on their screen. Yep, good idea. And then while they're thinking, I'll just um, I'll just remind everybody that a lot of the conversation will be driven around um, objectives of the sampling. So, Tracy and Kathleen actually earlier mentioned that maybe there was quite a bit of a delay between when the occurrence, when the outbreak started and when you all are now setting foot on the property. So what's happened in that time period with the disease progression and how might that change how easy it is to find, find an infected fish? So kind of keep that in mind too. Are we looking for an infected fish out of many infected fish? Are we looking for an infected fish out of you know, a needle in a haystack? Are we trying to prove that it's not there anymore? So all of those questions matter. Seems like we have a question in the chat. Would you like me to yep, read it out? Um, no, I think yeah, we're good. good. Julie? Yep. Yeah, I think just, let's just wait a minute, let a couple more people think, and, and then we'll come back and go through them. Thank you. These are some great questions, you guys. Yeah, I can see they're coming in both ways. Some of them are just to all panelists and some are to participants, so everyone can't see each other. Okay, so I can, um, right. everyone who hasn't answered yet can keep going. Tracy, do you want to read these and phone your friend or do you want me to read them to you? Well, 
We're phoning Lori. Okay. Um, Lori, how are you? Bring, bring. Okay, Tracy. <laughs> I want to be in Idaho. <laughs> well, it's on the pretty phone nice out phone. here. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you what we've found so far. And uh, I've got Kathleen and Lynn standing here next to me. Um, so we're here. It's April 11th. And what we're hearing from the owner is that um, two different age groups of fish were present on the farm. He thinks it was a shipment back in February. Um, and that he took samples of the fish and submitted them to a private laboratory, and both groups were positive for tilapia lake virus. And what um, month are we in now? He submitted it. Well, in we're in April. We're in April. It's been a couple we're months now. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what we're seeing is we've got um, this hatchery and nursery building. And then we've got these um, two sets of three raceways with different age group fish, um, but all the water is the same. So it's flowing out of an underground spring. It's warm water, spring water, and it's flowing first through the upper set of raceways and then into this lower set of raceways um, before it goes out. Uh, the, the nursery and hatchery, though, um, seems to be separate, a separate water system. Kathleen, Lynn? Yeah, it doesn't contact the raceway water. It's separate. It's and piped the two raceways are from the spring. From each other? Sorry. The raceways are all connected as a flow-through design, but then the water in the hatchery house uh, is a dedicated line from the point source of the spring into the hatchery house. And I think Kathleen asked him a lot of questions about his equipment. He is um, using dedicated equipment in the nursery and hatchery building, and he's sanitizing that. Uh, but he, and he uses a different set of equipment for the fish in the raceways. So, so there are two two things that we need to kind of get straight in our heads um, before you decide how many to sample and where to sample. Well, sort of three things. One is um, one is where are we at in the progression of disease? Is it probably running rampant throughout the site, or has it been kind of managed in some fashion so that it's either gone now or dampened and hard to find? So that's one question. The other is, um, how you know how many like you guys are getting at how many different populations do we have to sample? Do we have to do we have to prove that it's free on the site in general, or do we have to prove separately that it's free in the hatchery nursery system and separately that it's free in the raceways? And then the third question is how do we decide how to apportion our samples? You know where do we where do we focus? That, that's a huge raceway. So how do we pick those fish? So I think the second question you guys were getting at is leading me to believe that there might be two distinct populations. Do you feel like that's true? Do you feel like there are, or do you feel like there are ways that if disease were in the hatchery, it would also probably be in the raceway and vice versa? Well, the heart of Kathleen, those breaks. Well, correct me if I'm wrong. He told us that he depopulated the two lots of fish that he thought were affected. Um, and that he disposed of them. I think that is the, correct. He has a waste flood, a waste pond, and then he threw out the fish carcasses. Um, but yeah, I think based on our assessment, it does feel like two different water pop. You know, if we consider water as the common denominator, there's two distinct populations: this really young hatchery nursery group, and then there are various age groups in these raceways, but they do share the same water source, and the water's flowing. So, so the the good part about that is that's excellent farm management to separate your fish. The bad part about that is if there are separate populations, so you have to sample each of them as if they're two different sites. So, what do, what do our participants think? Do we have do we have two different sites? What other things could we be asking? 
those on the ground to decide if we have to treat these as two populations or if we get to say they're one. Anything that I've got a question in mind and I'm going to see if you guys have others. I'll just go ahead and address uh, Richard's question there. The fish were not tested prior to import um, in this scenario. Right, and I will address Natalie's question. Um, ideally, the conversation for indemnity comes in uh, as you're preparing for the field investigation. Um, in this case, we were not offering indemnity. So this was voluntary on the part of the producer. Biosecurity, shared food, or equipment. Yep, we're capturing all of that in the EPI questionnaire. Um, yeah, and I, good. I just, I want to weigh in too here to make sure everybody's clear what we shared with you. In this case, what actually happened, the farmer, once receiving those initial diagnostic results from the private laboratory, went ahead and voluntarily depopulated those populations that he had um, that had been tested positive. So we really, we already knew we were in a situation where we were really looking to see if it had left that hatchery house too. What, cause he had then received additional fish um, through imports as right. well. So it was like a whole new farm, if you will, in a lot of case, in, the, in, the, in that sense. And so, All right, Kathleen, Lori, one of the questions, yeah. yeah. I was just going to say, in the interest was, of time, we need to roll on. Yep. Okay. One of the questions I was going to ask, Kathleen, is where did those waste, um, where did those waste fish end up? Because would, is it possible that they contaminated the raceways, that the, the water may have been contaminated? Nope. There was no, yeah, no water left the farm. He had a um, detention pond where all water uh, goes to and settles out there on the farm. The carcasses, as I recall, he has a dumpster, and those carcasses had been dumped in a dumpster, and it was covered. And we certainly didn't see a lot of evidence of birds or anything else that might have been a vector of spreading those around to the raceways. Okay, so so my conclusion would be that there are two separate populations, the hatchery, nursery system, the raceways would be another, um, that we've got, we've had um, effective control measures, presumably pretty strong control measures since that initial introduction. So the chance that there's something rampant on the site is, is not very high. It's much more likely we're gonna get there and see pretty healthy fish. Um, especially if you cleaned and disinfected before you repopulated. So, so in that case, we're, we might be looking for a needle in a haystack. If, if we were arriving in the middle of an outbreak, at the kind of peak, um, we could probably get away with sampling some of the diseased fish, sending them off, and we could probably get what we need. But in this case, it sounds like we're um, swimming upstream. It's, it's going to be a little <laughs> bit harder to, to find um, cases if they're there. And we do need to confirm. We also have an owner that probably isn't super psyched to have us there. So our emphasis is going to switch to let's get let's get as much information as we can on that first visit that we're there, so that we don't have to keep flagging them, we don't have to keep going back, and let's look hard enough that when we leave, we can convince ourselves we're, we're, when we have that those results, we can convince ourselves that we haven't missed anything. So. It's kind of, even though we're looking for cases, it's kind of shifting towards the disease freedom kind of objective. Um, so what else do you want us to cover, Tracy? That's perfect. So in the end, we, um, we not only got a total number of fish, we were aiming for, I think, uh, 350 fish, um, roughly, and we also got this is the end case definition, but this is a, sort of the case definition that we were working under. Um, again, as Lori mentioned, as we were collecting fish for sampling, we were looking for 
any suspect cases, you know, anything exhibiting clinical signs, which we really didn't see. The fish looked pretty healthy while we were there, but um, these case definitions would have helped us target our sampling efforts on farm if any of these had applied. Um, as a reminder, you'll get these slide decks, but we wanted to just show you, you know, some of the work that SIA was doing simultaneous to the field investigation to really clarify what the case definitions were, how we were categorizing the cases that we saw, and um, reporting out to OIE. So then, um, Lynn's going to now cover, you know, sort of the on-site uh, collection of samples and talking about the work that we did there after, you know, Sia had recommended to us, Lori had recommended that we were collecting a lot of fish, a lot of samples. <laughs> Lynn? First, first, I want to say really good um, chat going on, so um, keep that going, guys. And, yeah, the, the first response is, you know, wow, Sia recommended a lot of fish for our sample. And that's a, another good point for aquaculture investigations. It's often good to put together a team so that you have a group that can, um, maybe you can have multiple, multiple people necropsying the fish, um, someone else who's helping bag the samples, someone else who's um, keeping the records. So it really helps to have a group. Um, and in this instance, uh, we already talked about, hey, this was a new situation, a new disease. A lot of us had not done a lot of fish necropsy, so what did we do when we all got there? We gathered around the tailgate of a truck, and Kathleen gave us a quick down and dirty, this is how to necropsy these fish and how to collect the samples that the lab says they um, need the fish. It turned out that from each fish we collected four samples, the liver, spleen, posterior, kidney, and heart. And so it took a few minutes to put each fish, and um, we luckily could put all those tissues into one world pack bag, so that sort of um, simplified things a little bit, but still, 350-ish fish, um, that's a lot of fish. Um, some of you, and then once we did that, that tailgate training, and um, those of us that were there got to participate in the necropsies over and over with that repetition of collecting the samples. Um, we, in doing that process, created uh, a sort of a train the trainer situation. And um, in those situations, the local district people that were helping um, got a lot of experience so that when, once we left and they needed to go back to collect additional samples or maybe on another site, collect samples, they were um, experts. <laughs> and so a lot of you are on the call today um, that participated in this particular outbreak. And so um, I'm curious for you just to enter into the chat um, how you felt that process worked for you in developing your skill set and your knowledge and comfort level around um, doing an investigation in fish necropsy. So, um, just to, to complete the, the thoughts for this slide, uh, we did collect those samples, and we had um, actually a little bit less than 350, a total of 326 fish samples, um, and we submitted those to NVSL for testing, and they did both PCR and virus isolation. They were going to follow up, actually, PCR on all, and then they were going to follow up with virus isolation on any that were PCR positive. And ultimately, out of all those samples, um, we had no PCR positives that were detected in the, the sampling. That is true. And um, at the same time, as we were continuing the conversation with the owner, the producer, and completing the EPI questionnaire, um, we, we ended up calling him back a couple of days later to ask some follow-on questions, and we asked him, and, and he did provide all the paperwork related to animal movements on and off the farm. We decided to back it up to um, October 1st because some of the things that we were hearing were not completely making um, complete sense, and as we went back and checked with laboratory testing records and everything, it felt like 
the introduction wasn't actually in February. It might have been as early as October 1st of the year before, so um, three or four months before what we were thinking. And indeed, what we found were that um, was that he had shipped fingerlings to premises in four other states, Wyoming, Idaho, Colorado, and Florida. So that production model that Kathleen described at the beginning is his primary moneymaker, but he occasionally shares fingerlings and sells those to four production facilities in other states, and they grow them up and grow them out. So now we had a whole different situation on our hands. Uh, Lynn, do you want to share some about those trace outs? Sure, and we're going to concentrate on three of the four sites where fish went, that ones that had a, some twists in the interest of time. So I'm going to t tell a little bit of a story about Colorado and Wyoming. Um, one of those um, premises did have a history of consistent mortality uh, for tilapia lake virus, and one had no history of signs. Um, both of them ended up in our, in our investigation to be test positive. But one of the really interesting things we ran into to with both of these sites in Colorado and Wyoming is that they were prison facilities. So basically they were aquaculture operations that were in prisons, teaching inmates tilapia production and marketing. And so um, these were really interesting premises to visit as part of an investigation. Can um, you guys think of some of the challenges we might have faced in trying to do an investigation in a prison facility? Interesting twist, Lynn. So um, we'll let you keep going on, on the talk, but uh, to our attendees, uh, now, now you're faced with the added um, challenge that we're tracing out, and it, it seems that the fingerlings were shipped to two separate prison correctional facilities in Colorado and Wyoming. So just put that in your cap and maybe write down your ideas of what, what added um, details might be coming on. Just what, what other challenges are we going to face? Perfect. And then you, I'll, I'll keep on going. So, you know, one of the things that was interesting that we don't typically run into is that we all had to have background checks done in order to be able to go um, actually enter the prison facilities. Um, they also, of course, were very concerned about our necropsy instruments. So all of our instruments had to be inventoried going in and out to make sure we didn't leave scalpels or scissors there. Um, we had to, to give up all of our um, cell phones and electronics, so that also created a challenge. If Once we got in there, we couldn't call our friends anymore for advice. And then we had a lot of accountability for um, any chemicals, like the MS-222, which is a, a chemical agent that's a, an anesthetic agent for fish that we can also use as a euthanasia agent when we um, use it as an overdose. And um, ethanol, just the alcohol for sanitizing our equipment. So um, it was very interesting and challenging. Another twist in um, these two states had to do with regulatory authorities. In Colorado, the state veterinarian was actually able to issue a hold order for that facility. But in Wyoming, this wasn't the case. And um, uh, Kathleen touched on this earlier when um, uh, she was talking about um, regulatory authorities. Uh, the SAHO didn't have authority the um, Natural Resource Agent didn't have authority over tilapia in particular. So um, the, the obvious question to you guys is what would you do um, in the, in the um, interest of time, and because we discussed this a little bit earlier, um, just to, to cut to what we ended up doing, the Wyoming State Veterinarian uh, worked with the prison leadership to help us identify someone who could be an authority in that framework and could provide us a written assurance that the animals would not move out of that premises until um, all of our requirements were satisfied. So that was our, our way we jury-rigged uh, uh, a hold order. 
Any questions on any of that? Absolutely. Information you can... coming in. Yeah, oh, sorry, Chase. Go ahead. I was just going to say challenges. So access, obviously, getting into the prison, as, as Lynn said, background check, making sure that, that our people are clear, inventory of tools and equipment, um, chemical agents and loss of your phone and electronics. So definitely some added hurdles here as you're entering the prison grounds to complete your necropsies. And that's a super interesting twist in the story. And as well as trying to explain to the uh, commissioner in charge of the Department of Corrections for the state why we needed a quarantine or a hold order. Which really takes us into response. So. As we go through these um, outbreak investigations, always, you know, you're trying to implement prevention and control measures with aquatic animal species. Sometimes that's a little bit challenging, um, communicating the findings to these different partners and explaining both the actions as well as the resolution, also a bit of a challenge. Um, in this particular instance, we came up with a number of tools developed throughout the response, and I'm going to um, let Kathleen start covering some of those tools that are also now available. You know, now this, again, was sort of our brand new, one of the first times we'd really um, sort of had to think through some of these things and start developing them. So, Kathleen? Sure. So, um, and in this particular case, we had an owner who um, promised to be difficult, um, and we wanted to be sure that our communication was very clear about what the expectation was. Um, also, the index state uh, did the state veterinarian did issue a quarantine on the farm, but. The condition of that quarantine stipulated that they would release the quarantine when APHIS decided it was okay to do so, which completely put the onus on us to delineate what would satisfy us to make sure that the virus no longer existed or there was a risk of the virus leaving the farm. So we really looked to the poultry examples of a PREM plan, um, which we have now tweaked um, for aquaculture, both in the fin fish world and the shrimp world, which outlines um, how we, what has to be met in order to release the quarantine or hold order from the farm, uh, and then any biosecurity stipulations, and that also one component that I thought was a good thing to add in here was the farmer did intend to continue to import fish from at-risk countries, and so we very clearly, as the last point of that PRIM plan, was that this whole issue, once we considered it resolved, it was resolved, and if we got another detection, uh, that that would open up another case because they would be new animals coming into the site. So that was a really important piece of information there. Also, because of the quarantine on the farm, he um, had limited ability to move animals off the farm. He had a number of those raceways that had tilapia that already had exceeded a pound. Plate size for tilapia is around a pound and a half to two pounds. His head on market was around one and a half. He did have some farm gate sales um, for human consumption, and he did uh, slaughter those animals at the gate for those people. Um, but he also had destination um, markets, particularly along the West Coast, where trucks of these one to one and a half pound fish would be shipped live across state lines and then end up in a live seafood market. In order to allow animal welfare to continue on that farm, stocking densities were increasing as this uh, quarantine period um, went on. We did look to the controlled marketing um, examples that exist in other commodities and then tweaked that um, to be applicable to the interstate movement of aquatic animals that were going to what we considered a negligible, low-risk um, market. 
We do have a couple of stipulations again in there about the shipping water and how the transportation vehicles would be handled. It's important to remember if a state does not have regulations around that, tr uh, car wash or truck wash stations discharge into the local sewer. So to it, you know, we built that in that they have to go to the, one of these places where the transport water could be disposed of safely and washed um, at those locations so that we weren't endangering uh, natural resources or other um, facilities in the, in the end use area. One thing about those um, controlled marketing plans, and we did write that in, is that they would have to be approved by the destination state. We never got to that point in this particular case, nor with our shrimp examples. Um, and so again, if you see the, the back half of this form that Tracy's showing now, it does say everybody agrees um, from the, the, the um, exporting state to the receiving state that everybody is aware of what the situation is. Exactly, and these are just examples of the forms. I think they've continued to be refined and they are other examples of the types of support that the team can provide in terms of getting these things pulled together. Um, not to undersell the importance of the communication of findings, so um, these activities, this particular investigation, did result in a federal order and a proposed rule. We've done multiple presentations to the partners and stakeholders, and that's sort of the outward facing stuff. As you can tell, you know, we've been relying on our own internal situation reports. We were generating situation reports initially every couple of days, then we went to weekly as the, situ as the investigation unfolded. Um, and communicating constantly with our import-export center in VS. And we do have Alicia Marston on the phone with us today um, to answer any trade questions that come up as we close out. So moving into our lessons learned and next steps. Um, so the case definitions are definitely needed. Uh, Lynn is gonna join me on sort of sharing some of these lessons learned. We've kind of emphasized, I think, maybe ad nauseum, the authority for aquaculture, it depends. And that's a really critical component of these investigations, particularly if you need to issue any hold orders or quarantine orders. Lynn, anything you want to add there? Um, just that, you know, um, for aquaculture and, and for this example, I think we illustrated some of the more challenging elements in these lessons learned and, and how we overcame them. And on the outreach and education part, the industry was really grateful for our efforts to meet their needs and we, the development and implementation of the federal order to control import risks to protect them and all the work that was done in that outwardly facing communication and outreach. Um, was um, appreciated and we need to always strive for this in our investigations. And then um, I think, you know, while this, our storyline and sort of the, the events that we played out here really focuses on a lot of the um, lift that the commodity team and FEIS did in this instance, we really want you to focus on the role of local teams and that's you. Um, we're telling the story to illustrate that what we did um, in the investigation part of this in particular, um, anybody can do. So, mm -hmm. um, and that the, the information that, you know, if you don't know or you don't feel comfortable, uh, we're out there and you can phone, phone us, your friends, to provide whatever resources you need. Tracy, I'll Absolutely. Well, um, and the final bullet here, getting to know your partners before an outbreak, that brings us to basically one of the final slides here is, you know, we recognize that this is a bigger challenge than it would be in other situations because of the COVID situation, but as you can, we would we challenge you to really reach out and begin to understand what aquatic animal health production is happening in your state who the players are, um, who has what authority, and um, 
you know, before this outbreak, I don't, and those of us who have lived in Colorado for multiple years, we had no idea that prison populations were raising tilapia for retail production, and we had no idea that was happening in Wyoming. Um, I'm in Minnesota now. I have no idea whether there's any commercial aquaculture here, but, you know, those are some of the questions. Start reaching out. Find out who the players are, who, who has what authority, and also take advantage of the trainings. I think Kathleen has a list of trainings that are available that we can send out as an email after this. Um, for our, uh, you know, for the slide deck, as you go back and review this, here's all of our contact information if you need us. And uh, we're just sort of um, staying. We're, we're opening it up for questions now. You guys have been great playing along with all of that. And we can uh, certainly address any questions that we didn't get answered as we walked through the scenario. You can put those questions in the chat again. No questions? Yeah, Tracy, I'm not seeing anything coming through the chat. Um, let's just make sure that the handouts that we've sent are, are arrived and then anything that we are um, going to send, we can give a recap of. Well, um, absolutely. I'll start recapping the handouts. And in the meantime, if, even if you don't have any questions, if you have comments, by all means, we'll get a Word document printed out um, that will show all of your comments and we would love to hear how we can improve these outbreak investigations, especially when we're delivering them virtually, but things that you're still, you know, where are you most comfortable? Where are you least comfortable? What can we do to help support those investigations in the field? I do see a couple of questions, comments coming in. Um, Michelle, uh, is there a PR person just for, does that mean public relations or Puerto Rico? <laughs> <laughs> or, or a different PR, um, and you're welcome, everyone else, and, and thank you for participating. But I'll, I can probably answer that more for Michelle, um, if, if you can clarify. Uh, public relations. Uh, no, uh, there is not, um, but certainly your aquaculture staff is, is well-versed. Um, Kathleen and Alicia and Lori all talk a lot. Um, if, obviously, it's a big outbreak, um, you know, and, and you went to IMT level or something like that, you'd have a public information officer. And um, LPA, I found, is always um, very, very helpful, especially if you're giving anything, you know, like a, a news release or any type of, um, you know, outreach information, things like that, then um, LPA is, is always a good resource for you. And aquaculture or um, Lynn, any of the commodity folks have addition to to um, add on to that? I don't. That was good, Julie. Well, we certainly hope you enjoyed our little tale here in the, um, as I mentioned, I would give a recap of the handouts. This is the list of handouts that were in the email. Um, you can certainly call us for any updated versions of questionnaires. I know that we're working, the larger we specifically, Lynn and Kathleen and others are working with the Center for Informatics to help um, move some of these questionnaires into a more of an electronic format so you can do them on the fly, on the ground, and not have to hand enter your data later. Um, but again, we're all here to help. We appreciate your time and attention today, and it's been really, really fun. Any closing comments from the rest of the team? I'll just pop in and say this is Lynn. We were going to put together our Walmart shopping list for you guys on what um, you can source locally for aquaculture um, sampling, so we'll get that out to you. Awesome. Just great job, you guys. Always fun. 
Thanks. Thank you all. Really appreciate it. And all you right. can always call if you need us. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, all everyone. Right. That concludes Great job, everybody. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.